This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Daniel Simons, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Illinois, and also the uh, co-author of a couple books. Uh, most recently, a book called Nobody's Fool, Why We Get Taken In and What We Can Do About It, uh, and also um, this older book, also co-authored with Chris Chabri, called The Invisible uh, gorilla, uh, welcome, Dan. Oh, thanks for having me on. So, look, when I when I got this uh, latest book, uh, Nobody's Fool, um, you know, of course, this is a topic uh, that is of deep interest to me, which is kind mm -hmm. of how not to be persuaded, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. we at business schools, we we teach a lot of courses on on persuasion, right? Like how to get other people mm -hmm. to you know agree with you. How do you get other people to kind of do what you want them to do? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I, I consider my role in the business school as kind of the, the one that teaches the students how, how not <laughs> to be persuaded, <laughs> how, how not to, you know, get um, compelled to, to doing stuff that, you know, you, you shouldn't be doing. And so yeah. in, you know, my accounting class, I spent a lot of time on things like, um, you know, shenanigans, right, accounting fraud, and, mm -hmm. and you know, my um, data and decisions class, spent a lot of talk, time talking about how people can uh, manipulate data and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And, and so, you know, when I saw that the title of this book was, you know, how, why we get taken in and what we can do about it, it reminded me that when I talked to um, Bob Cialdini, mm -hmm. his book Influence was originally motivated by this um, desire to coach people on how not to be persuaded and yet the book yeah. wound up becoming like the bible of you know how, how to how to persuade and, and i think yeah. you really stuck to the original point which is you know how do you become a better consumer of information consumer of analyses and and you know consumer if we can call it that of persuasive efforts on the part of of others um, so, you know, is this kind of like a, a if I think of your, if your first book is kind of a guidebook to attention, this is kind of like mm -hmm. a guidebook to persuasion, although it clearly builds on the earlier book. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think of the, the first book as more uh, an exploration of how our intuitions about how our own minds work often can be misleading and can be wrong based on our experiences. And this book is more about how our patterns of thought and sort of the information that we find really appealing and attractive can lead us down the wrong path. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I hope it, I hope it doesn't become, you know, how to manual for scammers. I, I don't think it will because that's not really <laughs> what we're, what we're aiming for. But, um, you know, scammers already kind of understand how our minds work. They take advantage of it either implicitly or explicitly. They take advantage of what we find really appealing, what we, what we want to believe. And the problem for most of us is that we don't typically think about how we can be deceived. So in that sense, I, I think it's probably more less likely to become a tool for scammers than for users and consumers. Yeah, well, scammers or, or magicians also. Yep. Now, look, yeah, yeah. Maybe I, I was wondering, if maybe we could start with the original, the first book, The Invisible mm -hmm. Gorilla, because, you know, this is really built on, I think, perhaps one of the most famous experiments you know, of, the, <laughs> of our time, one which I have used in my class many, many times. I, I don't mm -hmm. know whether we should... Um, you know, ruin the experiment by talking about it. At, I'm hoping that most point, people. At this point, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. At this point, think, it's pretty safe. I yeah. think at this point, most people have have experienced. But look, I remember the yeah. very first time when I encountered this experiment mm -hmm. uh, on the receiving end, and you know, subsequently have have used it and its successor experiment, the mm -hmm. monkey business illusion. You know, I mm -hmm. use it every year in in class, and almost every yeah. year it, it it works. And mm -hmm. what, as an economist, right? Um, you know, I've always been puzzled by whether or not the whole point of the experiment is about the attentional budget and how mm -hmm. there are these inevitable trade-offs right. versus, you know, is, there po is, is it possible, is there a fixed budget or is there a variable budget? Like, can mm -hmm. we invest in acquiring kind of... Yeah more attention and you know you you mm -hmm. kind of in, in the book and in, in all of your mm -hmm. research you, you've talked about how you know there's no individual differences and you know across the board yeah. you see this thing but then but then you highlight this one little thing where if you know if you're mm -hmm. a professional basketball player mm -hmm. then you can kind of do both right the focused and mm -hmm. the kind of peripheral attention so is, yeah, is it a, is, do people have a fixed <laughs> do people have a fixed attentional budget or can we expand our budget yeah. so 
I think that kind of leads to the a bigger question, which is, is there any way to kind of both pay attention to things and notice the unexpected stuff, right? So if if we have a limited pool of attention resources or juice, um, then the idea would be that really there's going to be limits to how much we can take in at any given time. Um, could we improve that? Maybe at the margins, right? So you're not going to suddenly massively double or triple your attention capacity, despite what you might find on some websites. You're not going to, you know, suddenly be able to take in everything by doing some training, right? Um, could you maybe increase your ability to perform a focused attention task, like counting passes? Absolutely, right? You can practice that. If you practice gaming, for example, you're going to get better at that. If you practice doing that sort of task over and over again, you'll get more and more efficient at it. Will that make you better at noticing unexpected things? I don't think so. I mean, I think that's what we're finding with all of the individual differences work is that we can take people who can count passes or count bounces or in a computerized version of this twice as fast as other people. And I, I'm a slow counter. Other people are really fast counters. They can do this task. It's really easy for them. And they're no more likely to notice the unexpected thing. So it's not just about sort of how much juice you have. It's also about how likely we are to pay attention to and notice things that we weren't looking for in the first place. Right. Now, look, at, you know, mm -hmm. I tell all my students and my, my friends and colleagues that mm -hmm. at, at the end of every accounting period, they should go back and look at kind of how they spent their money. Right. You know, go look at their personal finance software and say, OK, where'd the money go? And then I, I tell them also, you know, you should do this with your attention. Right. Mm -hmm. Go back and look and see, like, you know, where did your attention go? And I think one of the good things about your research is that it mm -hmm. really forces you to kind of bring that to the surface yeah. and say, like, OK, you know, where do I want to be uh, on this attentional, you know, mm -hmm. frontier? But, yeah. but, um, but in, in the experimental setting, mm -hmm. you know, y you, you clearly have these two options, but in, in the wild, mm -hmm. there are all sorts of other things that might be kind of drawing attentional resources without sure. our even, without even being aware of it. Right. Like, so mm -hmm. I've, I've seen these studies where, you know, if you have your phone just sitting mm -hmm. on the table here, mm -hmm. that's kind of like draining your battery so that you're going to perform yep. worse on, you know, both the counting task and the, you know, the, the gorilla noticing yeah. is, 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 is a way to improve your attentional resources, maybe kind of identifying these kinds of taxes or, or, well, or drains and then kind of, you know, eliminating them. Sure. And that, that's a real challenge because we don't often realize when something is drawing on our resources. Right. So I think one of the reasons people, uh, have bad intuitions about this is that their experiences don't tell them when they've missed things, right? So if I were to show you the original sort of gorilla video and you counted the passes and you didn't see the gorilla and I never asked you about the gorilla, you'd go on through life believing that of course you'd always notice something like that, right? If you drive and talk on the phone and you get home consistently, you'll go through life thinking you're just fine driving and talking on the phone without realizing how much you're weaving across the lanes or distracted, right? Because we're unaware of what we haven't you know, haven't seen, right? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the real challenges in that sort of a case, right, and having a phone there that is kind of diverting some of your attention, you have to realize it in order to know that you have to do something about it. And mm -hmm. our intuitions about what takes away our resources and what doesn't is not great because we don't really understand the workings of our own minds. There's a really nice study of this, when, you know, driving and talking on the phone is one of the examples that I use a lot. And um, one of the things that's interesting about it is that yeah, talking on a phone impairs your driving, but driving impairs your talking on a phone, mm -hmm. too. It impairs your conversations. So um, we're kind of tapping into the same sort of resources without realizing we're doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. now, now, Max Bazerman and others talk about the power of being a noticer, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. you can tell stories about how, you know, also, there's a great example in the book about pilots who, mm -hmm. right, you know, fail to notice the you know, runway incursions yeah. and so forth, which can lead to accidents. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if we if we want them to start paying attention to that, then presumably they have to pay attention to something else uh, to, to a lesser extent. Yeah. So, um, you know, how should we, how should we think about mm -hmm. what the ideal allocation is? Obviously it's going to be environmentally uh, contingent, yeah. but, you know, if we're, for instance, training doctors, Mm -hmm. uh, radiologists and so forth. I mean, yes, the radiologist is going to miss that that catheter, right, that you described mm -hmm. in the book. Yep. Yeah. Do we want them to? I mean, it, which yeah. do we need to? Do, you know, should we run things through? If we're thinking about, I mean, you talk about Theranos and all these yep. other things. 
part of the reason why these things get missed is because presumably every single VC that looked at Theranos was asking the same set of questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right? So is, is this an argument in favor of, you know, having people with diverse yep. um, attentional states kind of working together? Like, you know, did, should Bazerman be Absolutely. saying, let's have, let's have a noticer there along with a focuser, you know, and then Absolutely. have them work together? I think that's often going to be the best strategy, right? So radiologists are often looking through a set of radiographs and they're looking for specific things, right? Because they know what the potential problem is that they're looking for, which means that they're not as likely to spot something that's not that. Right. So if they're looking for a nodule in a lung, they might not notice a fracture, right? Um, because it's just not what they're searching for. Um, so there, there are strategies you can adopt for that. You have people who are going in without an, a set for what they're looking for, right? So if you just watch the gorilla video and don't bother paying attention to the players, you'll see the gorilla, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not devoting attention to the thing you're looking for. And this is kind of a general problem with attention, right? We, we tend to focus on one thing really, really well, and we need to do that. We need to be able to filter out those distractions. So you want people looking for the thing they're supposed to find, because most of the time, that's what you want them doing, right? You want them devoting their resources to the diagnosis that's most likely. Um, it's just that every now and then, you're going to miss something that's sometimes rare and sometimes not what you're looking for, right? Magicians capitalize this, on this all the time, right? They, they tell their audiences indirectly or directly what they should be paying attention to, and that's not what they should be paying attention to if you want to figure out how they're doing it. Right. right. Um, you know, in the book, you didn't mention that um, image that has the gorilla in it. <laughs> you know, that famous, yep. that must have come after the book, right? Where, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love yeah. that. There are a lot of allusions to that study in, in, other, in other studies. There are actually a whole series of studies of uh, radiologists looking at x-rays or radiographs in which they've inserted gorillas. It, it's, it's kind of... The majority of inattentional blindness failures of awareness studies like that in radiology have gorillas in the images, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. which is a little strange because, you know, that's not something that ever happens. So it is totally unexpected, but it's also kind of totally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, your emphasis is on the, the individual to mm -hmm. the most, for the most part, and the individual's attention. But I, I can never, I couldn't help but note the parallels between your work and what happens in the organizational design literature, yeah. right? So, mm -hmm. you know, presumably the yeah. person in your experiment who is counting the basketballs is doing so because you've, you've, you've set that out as the goal. Like here, mm -hmm. here's what your job is. Here's what you're yep. going to do. And so when organizations, you know, tell their employees, like, you know, here's your, here's your job, here's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Here are the metrics by which you're going to be evaluated. That necessarily, you know, is going to yep. lead them to, to focus on, on those things. Right. Yeah. So, so, you know, can, a lot of times we talk about you know, organizations having to have kind of a, a single unity of, of purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that seems to maybe be a problem. You know, could, should, we, should we have, you know, make sure that we have non-overlapping functions within the organization? Yeah, or, or even have people whose primary role is to question the assumptions, right? So having the equivalent of a red team, right? A team that yeah. is not trying to further your goals. They're trying to point out weaknesses in your in your business plan or weaknesses in your in your you know product design um, that that sort of you know tactic if, as long as it as long as you actually adhere to it and you just don't want to hear oh everything's great right can be can be really helpful because it if you have people who aren't I mean, trying to further the agenda and the task that you've given them but are instead trying to look for problems they're more likely to spot the problems that's what their that's what their task is mm -hmm. Yeah, like in Silicon Valley Bank, right? Um, you know, they had no chief risk officer for yeah. like. I mean, I, I as I'm as someone who teaches banking, I'm just yeah. so blown away by how that could, how you could possibly not have yeah. anybody within the organization sort of raising their hand and saying, "Hey, have we taken a look at our duration gap <laughs> in the yeah. last couple of years?" Yeah, I mean, it's it's a huge problem in in most fields, right? It's true in the sciences as well. So in the sciences, we have peer review, right? So you, mm. you're supposed to have experts who are thinking critically about your work. But a lot of shoddy work gets out there for various reasons. You've got small numbers of people looking at it. And there aren't really science police. I mean, there are very few of them mm -hmm. who are almost all doing it voluntarily, going in and trying to track down where the problems are and get things corrected. Right. So it, it's, you know, it, ideally we'd, we'd have risk officers or people who are looking for those problems all the time in, in disciplines where it matters. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in some cases it doesn't matter that much, but in, in, in business, it, it has costs and in science it has you know long-term consequences 
Well, you spend a lot of time in the new book talking about the mm-hmm. kind of replication crisis, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, Dietrich that, yeah. Stoppel is my favorite example of this, yeah. right? He, what do you have, like 50, 50 55, and then... 58, yeah, yeah. refractive papers. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I talk about yeah. him in, in my class. Yeah. I, I also uh, yeah. talk about um, uh, Brian uh, Wasink, and, Wasink. I, you know, mm-hmm. I, and I also talk about uh, Mark Hauser, mm-hmm. right? You know, and, and these these are examples of where, you know, the expert community was sort of, you know, yep. taken in. Um, mm-hmm. Now, yeah. is is that because of, I mean, there's system-wide, it's a lack of mm-hmm. checks and balances, right, mm-hmm. and a lack of this, you know, red teaming. But but at each individual researcher level, I think mm-hmm. this, this would fall into the, um, I guess, which of the four, uh, I guess this would fall into the commitment, um, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. the, the, the commitment um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. uh, heuristic, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it actually... Multiples of these long-term scientific frauds kind of tap into multiple uh, sort of principles for why we why we fall for them. And what's interesting about many of these cases is they're typically caught eventually by a whistleblower, not by you know looking at the scientific articles. Because in cases like Stoppel, right, his his work was clever, right? It was next step advances over previous studies, but it fit completely into the sort of zeitgeist of the field. It was it was kind of what people expected to see. It was just a little more impressive, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we should have been worried because his results were consistently good every single time, right? Um, you know, I, I kind of heard people say, I don't know what's in the water in the Netherlands, right? People kept getting these amazing priming results that maybe other people weren't getting, but their, the incentive structure was to publish a lot of papers and to kind of get those perfect results. When what we really should be expecting is noisy results, right? right. It, it's pretty rare to get the same thing every time, and not it doesn't really happen in, in psychology research, right? With the exception of things that are really well established and that are really pretty primitive to how we process the world. So, yeah, if I do a study of how well you can perceive a faint stim- symbol across against a gray background, and I do that by changing systematically how how much it stands out. We're going to get the same results every time, mm. right? It, it's pretty consistent. But if you're giving people a little priming task where they're under scrambling sentences and that changes their behaviors in the world, like, yeah, that's not going to happen. If it's true, if it happens at all, it's not going to happen the same way every single time. Right. right. Now, for each of the different psychological, uh, you don't use the term bias, right? But I think for yeah. each of these psychological tendencies that mm-hmm. is likely to lead you to error, you know, you provide a, kind of a fix, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, yeah. one one of them is um, to view more skeptically the things that you agree with, right, mm-hmm. than the yep. ones that you disagree with, or the ones yeah. that confirm or conform yeah. to your your pre- presuppositions. Yeah. And you know, I I had an earlier podcast right um, where I, I talked about this. Right, we have a tendency to be pretty good at, at picking holes yeah. <laughs> in things that, that, you know, that we, we don't like the conclusion of, yeah. but we're, we're really bad. And I thought a corollary to this was we should also view more skeptically claims made by people we like, right? Yep. Um, because, yeah. you know, we, we have a tendency to give them a pass. And, and it's totally natural, right? That things that are familiar to us, things that match our worldview, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to be as critical about them because they're what we're expecting to see. And that's how errors creep in in a lot of really important cases, right? It, um, you know, the famous Excel spreadsheet error from Reinhardt and Rogoff was exactly that sort of thing. It fit what they were trying to argue, so they didn't investigate it more thoroughly. But had the results come out the opposite way, they probably would have double checked their data. Yeah. Right? And we all do this, right? You have a prediction for how something's going to come out. If it comes out exactly the opposite of what you expect, you'll check and make sure you didn't get your coding reversed, right? But if it comes out exactly like you expected it, you're probably less likely to. And I, I think for a lot of these sorts of things, building in the sort of the mechanisms to automatically check, um, rather than having to think about it every single time, can help a lot. Right? So having that sort of red team equivalent mm-hmm. One thing you can do is have two people analyze the same data with different hypotheses going in. Do they end up with the same results? Or blinding yourself to what your conditions are so that when you analyze the data, you don't know what the outcome is until after you then reapply the labels and say, oh, okay, it came out in the direction I expected. Right? There, there are ways of sort of doing this in the sciences that can kind of take care of that problem uh, by eliminating your ability to influence and check uh, more thoroughly. It, you check your analyses before you get the data rather than after the data. How come we don't see more um, 
co-authors who come from different positions, right? This would seem to mm-hmm. make a lot of sense. Bring in people that start with different priors, different um, beliefs, yeah. and have them work together on experiments so that they can resolve them. It's like the idea of an adversarial collaboration where you yeah. get people who have disagreements and, and they come in and, and try and resolve them by doing the study. It's it's a wonderful idea in principle that becomes really hard in practice, right? Um, just because if you're coming at something from different viewpoints, presumably you're steeped in this literature, there are debates in that literature, people disagree, and ideally you want to kind of come to the right conclusion. But with any data set, any one data set's unlikely to completely resolve something. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there is a solution to this, which is uh, what we now call registered reports. Um, It's kind of how most people think science actually happens, which is you come up with a hypothesis, you specify what you're going to do, then you get your data and you see which hypothesis was supported. Um, In practice, you know, it it doesn't tend to work that way. Um, So registered reports are a way that you can do this sort of adversarial collaboration where you specify in advance what different patterns of results, how you would interpret them, right? And you can even write all of the analysis code so that you can specify, here's the conclusion it will automatically draw depending on how the data come out. And that has the advantage that it eliminates the, um, it eliminates the ability to kind of, after the fact, reinterpret how you, what you would have predicted, mm-hmm. right? which is how easily we can make sense of these things. I, I remember a, f- a famous case in my field, I won't name names, but it was somebody who was doing a postdoc uh, postdoctoral fellowship with the person they disagreed with. And they designed a study to resolve their disagreement. And they ran the study and they each interpreted it as consistent with their views. <laughs> right. So what do you do? Right. Yeah. Well, you didn't mention p-hacking, but you know, that's, yep. that's another, um, yeah. big tool in, you know, in your, yeah. that, that people use. Um, mm-hmm. so, you know, I, I teach a course on behavioral finance and, mm-hmm. um, one of the sections is on overconfidence, and uh, you know we, we tend to think that this is uh, common among amateurs, but mm-hmm. the experts perhaps are even more susceptible to, to overconfidence than, than the amateurs. And and uh, you know I love how you talk about Dan, Dan Kahneman. I mean Dan Kahneman, yeah. to his credit, um, had to you know backtrack from his mm-hmm. earlier assertions in you mm-hmm. know his book about priming studies. Um, yeah. Do Do you think I mean are, are are experts any better than, than amateurs when it comes to, say, overconfidence or willingness or credibility? Um, I think when they're in their own lane, absolutely. Mm. Right? Because expertise can be really protective. You're, you're going to recognize cases where you know, it, it just doesn't make sense, it doesn't hold together, it's inconsistent with other things that you know about. Um, the real danger comes in thinking you're an expert in things that you're not, mm-hmm. right? And you know, I think what happened with the, the priming research that, that Danny Kahneman sort of touted in Thinking Fast and Slow, um, and then much of it, much of that field sort of crashed and burned when others tried to reproduce and replicate their findings. Um, he, he later realized, okay, these were all small studies, but there were so many of them I was, you know, lead, leading to believe them, and I kind of wanted to believe them because I had this idea about you know, sort of automatic processing that fit it. Right, mm-hmm. so he wanted to believe it. He wasn't steeped in that literature or the methods in that literature, and I think he assumed that the way that people in his subfield of psychology did things, right, um, cognitive psychology, where there, there's much more of a focus on sort of getting the tasks right, right. Mm-hmm. Everybody kind of wants to be able to reproduce the results, even if it doesn't necessarily speak to anything in the world, which is the bigger issue for, for cognitive psychologists. Is, we do lots of studies that hold up just fine. It's just not clear that they have any relevance to anything. Um, social psychology had a different sort of way of going about things. And I don't think he realized that there was sometimes a disconnect there between the practices and incentives and methods in one subfield versus another. Um, and assumed that, well, of course people would make their data available. And of course they'd go and replicate their work before publishing it. And um, that wasn't the, the standard in, in sub parts of that field. Not, not the whole field, but in sub parts of that field. Now, now look, the overall takeaway of the book, Nobody's Fool, I think is, mm-hmm. you know, trust less, verify more, right? Yep. Accept but, less, check more. Yeah, same, same idea. Mm-hmm. But but yeah. but just like with attention, I mean, there's mm-hmm. you have a kind of a fixed budget, right? I mean, yep. you know, you have Absolutely. to go through life making yeah. assumptions. I remember my mom used to say, you know, don't assume makes an ass out of you and me. And I was like, mm-hmm. well, if I don't assume anything, like I can't get yeah. out of bed in the morning, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So, so how do we, how do we know whether we're, 
kind of trusting to the to the optimal amount. And one of the reasons why, yeah. you know, I mean, in, in the in the law, like Article Two is like you just gotta you just gotta trust somebody and mm -hmm. you know sort it out later. If if you go through life with yeah. your head on a swivel and you're constantly you know yeah that doesn't uh, work aware yeah. of you know all the things people are, everyone's robbing you and everybody's gonna then then you know yeah. you can't you can't get anywhere. So how do no, you know no. what the optimal allocation that's, of trust resources yeah. is that's the real challenge i mean we have to we have to trust and and we kind of have to accept what other people are telling us is true much of the time right it, otherwise you really couldn't function if you were a perpetual cynic and skeptic about everything you, you couldn't get anywhere right you, you'd be checking the ingredients on every box of food you buy to make sure it truly is what it says it yes. i mean there, there's you, you couldn't function in society um and be a perpetual skeptic and there's going, to be, there's going to be a spectrum of people who are going to be much more trusting and much less critical and skeptical and others who are much more skeptical. But you have to find this happy medium. And I think what we're trying to do in this book is identify the cases where we don't realize we're not being critical enough. Mm -hmm. right? And to what are those red flags? So the, the way I like to think about this is, is kind of the metaphor I like is um, a matador, right? Um, the matador has this red cape and they wave it around and the bull just charges straight forward, not even realizing that there's a blade hidden, right? And for us, there are lots of those red capes out there and we don't realize they're red capes, right? So when somebody's presenting us with, you know, a great opportunity to buy something that we've always wanted to buy, well, that's a perfect case to be extra careful, right? Because it's what we want. It's what aligns with our incentives. We, you know, it's kind of presenting it the way we want to expect it. And that's when we're likely to get scammed, right? Mm -hmm. Or we really like the idea of really consistent results, really consistent outcomes. Um, Madoff's Ponzi scheme was really appealing because it produced eight to 12% every year for year after year with no down years, right? That, that consistency is really appealing because we often take consistency as a sign of deep understanding and credibility when we really should be looking for noise and should take it as a red flag. So we need to kind of know when when should we just charge ahead without checking, or when should we say, okay, I I, I don't like that red flag, <laughs> or I don't like that red cape, I should I should be a little more critical of it. So the the purpose of our book is to kind of identify what are those things that that we tend to find really appealing. What stuff do we find appealing? What patterns of thought lead us to kind of jump right in without checking, and when should we balance that? Right. So. As you were saying, we can't check everything. There's no way. And you probably don't want to check the price of every item on your receipt against what was marked in the store. If you can afford a few dollars here and there that get you know lost because the register miscalculated, it's not worth your time, right? If you're buying you know a million dollar piece of artwork, yeah, it's worth your time. And it's worth your time to think about what somebody who is trying to scam you, what links they would go to in order to fool you. And, and like a magician setting up a trick and taking years to prepare it, somebody who's trying to con somebody out of a million dollars is absolutely going to spend years developing that technique. So those are times when, yeah, you should really be paying much more attention. Um, and being able to spot them is the key. Now, now as, as an economist, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I always think in terms of, you know, pooling and sorting, separating equilibria. And so, yeah. I mean, to be a con artist, I mean, this is kind of like a frequency dependent strategy, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, if there's too many con artists, then everybody's kind of alert to them. But mm -hmm. if there's a sufficiently small number of them, then people will just kind of, you know, yeah. let their guards down, right? And so yeah. is, it, is it surprising to you that there aren't more scams and cons? I mean, I, I think given how vulnerable and, and I mean, how right, trusting right. we all are, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always amazed that there aren't more cons and scams. There are a lot. <laughs> we, we just, part, part of it is that there are a lot of people, right, to, to potentially scam. And, you know, I think we're thinking about the big cons, right? The, the ones that take people for years or the, the long running Ponzi schemes. Um, those are probably relatively rare just because they take a tremendous amount of time, effort to set up in the same way that, you know, a, a really careful magician is going to set up that trick so that it just doesn't fail often. It, it takes a lot of expertise to, to do that. There aren't that many people who could pull off Theranos, right? Mm -hmm. But there are lots of people who can pull off simple scams and do, right? And I, I think what we, what we kind of confuse for the, the difference between being deceived at a sort of a day-to-day -day level versus being deceived on a grand scale, those grand scale ones are pretty rare. Mm -hmm. um, 
But, you know, there might be a lot of them out there that we don't know about because when people have been scammed, they often don't want to talk about it, right? right. It, it, it's embarrassing. So, um, and, you know, we all get scams, scams regularly. I mean, all of us get phishing emails all the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the scams are getting, you know, some of them are getting more sophisticated. So, um, but yeah, the, the fact that we have all these scams, I, I'm not sure there's really, we're anywhere close to an equilibrium right now. And part of the, one way to think about this is there are so many media reports of scams, right? News stories, great podcasts, you know, movies about scams. You know, the, the grand con movies have been around forever, right? And we don't seem to learn from them. <laughs> so we still fall prey to the same things and they all capitalize on the same tricks. They're really not that new. Um, you know, well, I think it's good. It's, kind of the same thing. Well, I think it's like you say, you know, when you're looking for a gorilla, you, you miss other things. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure that there will be, you know, there won't be very many VCs who get sucked into a, you know, blood testing scam, but you right. know, they'll be sucked into some other yeah. <laughs> scam well, in a different domain, right? Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, there's a lot of fudging at the boundaries that, you know, it's not really a scam or wholesale faking. But there's a lot of fudging at the boundaries of what some product can do and what it can't do. I mean, this is, this is like a tech industry staple, the, the demo that works only in a really constrained set of circumstances that's then sold as the future of X, right? Um, you know, it's not that hard to put together a demo that works. It's hard to put together a demo that is representative of everything that you would want something to do, right? And yeah, so so that's, you know, is that is that a con? No, not not really. Um, is it deceptive? Yeah, it, it can be if it's not, if it's sold as something bigger than what it actually is and, but it's really appealing and VCs don't want to miss out on the next big thing, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm sure there will be the equivalent, just not in blood testing. Yeah. Now look, if the book was only about, you know, multi-million dollar, uh, right. counterfeit art scams and Bernie Madoff and Theranos, then yeah. it probably would not have as much appeal as I think this book will have because you talk about kind of the everyday vulnerabilities yeah. that we have, you know, yeah. how susceptible we are to things like, you know, survivorship bias mm -hmm. and, um, you know, uh, shrouded attributes, right? So mm -hmm. in, in marketing, yep. I mean, I, I think of this as a version of, you know, price discrimination. The, mm -hmm. the people who are paying attention, they don't pay. And the people who are mm -hmm. kind of not paying attention, you know, they, yeah. they pay. And, you know, example yeah. I use in classes the resort fee at a, at a at a you know hotel in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. right? They, right? No one tells you about it, and then you, mm -hmm. you you leave and you see it on your on your bill, and yep. you know the people who pay attention see it and they protest. Oh, they, they just remove it. Yeah. <laughs> the other people, they just wind up kind of kind of paying it. It's, it's sort yeah. of an it's an inattention tax. It's really what it yeah. is, and and it's a familiarity with that with that particular you know way of way of playing the game, right? Um, you know, the resorts figure, well, we, we can get away with it unless people stop us. So we're going to, and nobody's stopping them. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think Shrouded Attributes is an interesting case, right? Because sometimes just looking a little further will show you what the actual costs of something are, but sometimes nobody will tell you and nobody really knows. It's just kind of built in. Right? So that, that's kind of a built-in form of daily deception that, you know, we rarely encounter. We don't, we don't have access to the same information that the person selling something to us does. Mm -hmm. Well, another tool that I found super useful is this idea of the, the possibility grid. Yeah. And, you know, it maps really nicely in with, say, you know, a confusion matrix, right, mm -hmm. in, in, in data science, right? Yeah. Where, and I, I found it puzzling, you know, I've been teaching statistics for, um, you know, 30 years, and mm -hmm. uh, I didn't never even before I started studying data science, I didn't know about the, yeah. the confusion matrix. You know, we talk mm -hmm. about type one, type two errors, mm -hmm. but unless you arrange the data in that, you know, two by two grid, it's, yeah. it's it hard to really register. make sense. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to make sense of the, the legitimacy of, of the, the, the classifier of the test. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, I, that's one of the things I can't, I teach statistics as well. And the whole type one, type two is, is just not something that's easy to grasp, mm -hmm. but thinking about rates, is something that we don't naturally do, um, but it's such an easy thing to do if you just take a little bit of time to lay it out that way, right? And realize, oh, okay, I don't know how often this this actually helps, right? So, you know, how many business books have we seen where it's like, hey, here's this, you know, amazing CEO, look at all the great things they did. Here's their history and that's why they succeeded. Right? It's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, how many people did exactly the same thing and failed, right? How many people didn't do those things that the CEO did? and 
succeeded, right? You need to know whether what they did had any difference in the rate of success, not just succeed and that's what they did, right? That, that doesn't tell you anything. Right. What's the baseline? What's the benchmark? Um, yeah. You know, wouldn't it be great if we could, I, I would love it if, if I could reconstruct something like that for, you know, when I think somebody's scamming me and they're not, <laughs> yeah. when I don't think they're scamming me and they are. I mean, the problem yeah. is, is getting access to, to that data. Like, yeah. uh, would we, wouldn't we need to have that data to know whether or not we're sufficiently, you know, vigilant? Yeah. Well, we often need that data in, in cases when we don't have it, right? So, I mean, one of the examples we use in the book is a consulting firm that's pitching you for their business. Mm -hmm. And what are they going to tell you about? Like every success story that they had, right? They're not going to tell you about their failures typically, right? And in principle, they're just that those data aren't going to be available to you unless you ask for it. Right? Yeah. So one of the one of the key things, and it, it seems like it's kind of trite, but just you know, asking additional questions, you know, asking, yeah. you know, what aren't you telling me, right? What can you show me some more companies, right? Mm -hmm. that, you know, can you show me companies that had a different timeline? Can you show me, you know, have you had companies that didn't show improvements? You know, what was different yeah. about them? And just pushing a little bit and it's uncomfortable and it's like, it's not what we want to do, but it, there are times when you know you need to seek that information in order to make a, a rational decision, make sure you're not being scammed. Right? Yeah, I, I did uh, some, I, I did a brief um, uh, workshop for a, a uh, rehab facility and mm -hmm. you know these, these folks charge an enormous amount of money right like thirty thousand dollars a month or whatever yeah. for for these rehab and i just asked them like okay so you know what happens to all the people when they leave mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> and then they said well after we send them on their way like we don't track them privacy yeah. right and i was like well what do you mean privacy right like how people are going to spend yeah. thirty thousand dollars and they don't know like whether yeah. or not this this thing you know works or not i mean i found that yeah. Astonishing, and I remember one time I was pitching uh, a startup recently, and and when I went to the VC's office, they had this anti-portfolio mm -hmm. right yep. on their yeah. wall. There are a couple of good ones that do. Yeah, that. yeah. and I mm -hmm. thought that was that was that's not just valuable to the yeah. people who are going in looking for money, but I think it's super valuable for the people who work there, right? Absolutely, because they can think about, hey, you know, we're not going to successfully invest in every company that succeeds, and we're going to make mistakes, and um, keeping track of those. It, doing that systematically is really a, a valuable thing for an organization, right? If they if they know, hey, here's what our hit rate, here's what our actual hit rate is, here's what we've missed, right? Here are the cases where we thought we had a winner and it crashed and burned and we lost everything, right? And if you analyze those, maybe you end up making better choices down the line. If you don't and you just remember the ones that were great, you know, then you're, you're likely going to make more mistakes because you're going to build up this intuition about what's working without necessarily having the evidence that you need for it, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're only looking at your successes. Now, why do you think people don't do do more verification? Um, you, you didn't mention, uh, I think it was, mm -hmm. it was uh, John Paulson, who is a famous mm -hmm. investor who invested mm -hmm. in a number of these Chinese companies that were uh, essentially mm -hmm. Potemkin villages, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it, it would have, the, the cost of verifying is really pennies on the dollar, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you send somebody over yeah. to China, <laughs> look around, you know? So yeah. why do you suppose folks don't ask more questions? Is it because they think that they're going to make other people uncomfortable? Well, it, it is uncomfortable, right, to, to push somebody and say, are you telling me everything that's it's essentially saying, you're not giving me all the information, you're withholding, right? And, you know, it can make people defensive. So finding the right way to do that, you know, even if it's just, what more can you tell me? And just keeping continually doing that until they start telling you things that they wouldn't have thought to tell you. Um, it's kind of a journalistic skill. But, so it, it's, it's, it's a skill to learn how to do that. But yeah, I think it's I think it's uncomfortable, right? Um, if you've got a ton of money that you're investing, of course they have, keeping in mind that whoever you're trying to invest in has an interest in you giving them their your money, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they're going to present themselves in the best possible light, um, and if you can get them to say, hey, you know, if you are completely straight with me and give me all of the information, that's going to make me more trusting of you. you know, mm -hmm. There should be noise, right? Again, it's, it's noise is often something that's good. If, if everything somebody tells you is exactly what you would hope it is, you should be worried right? mm -hmm. because, you know, that's, that's like, you know, a massive lottery win, right? It just doesn't happen much. Right? Now, I, I did a podcast recently on, on parasites and, and uh, mm -hmm. we said like, let's take a, let's look at the world through the parasites perspective, right? You know, who's, who's a prime target, right? And it turns mm -hmm. out humans yeah. are pretty good relative to other creatures. Mm -hmm. um, you talk a bit about how con artists are 
able to identify marks, right? So in the, yeah. in the hypnosis uh, environment, you know, mm -hmm. they, they weed out the people who are most vulnerable. In the mm -hmm. Nigerian prince scam, uh, mm -hmm. I, I love this, the mm -hmm. more outlandish... <laughs> Right, your your claims are yeah. the the that's actually a good thing because then you, yeah. you wind up getting the most vulnerable people. So how yeah. how from a con artist's perspective, how do you identify the people that are most likely to succumb to your uh, to your deceptions? Yeah, well, that's really the, the, the Nigerian email scam is I think a, a really good one because it's a relatively modern variant of something that you know I mean e email hasn't been around that long, right? And you know in order to pull off that sort of a con in the past it'd be incredibly labor intensive because you couldn't just select for gullibility, right? You couldn't just select the people who are most likely to give you money in the long run. But now you can send out millions of emails and you don't have to catch everybody. In fact, you don't want to catch everybody. You, if you or I got that email, we know it's a scam, mm -hmm. right? They do not want us responding because that will take up their time that they wouldn't then be able to use to reel in money. And it takes time once they get to the actual mm -hmm. interaction with somebody. So their goal is to exclude anybody who might be skeptical right? and instead go only for those people who really, really are desperate. Right? They want that, you know, that big reward with little effort. Right? And so including typos and weird language and having it just seem outlandish mm -hmm. um, is exactly the goal because they're filtering. Right. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, uh, something that's a much more labor intensive con, right? You know, the president's scam is a, is a you know, Gilbert Shikli's president scam where he would pretend to be the head of an organization, call somebody up at the mid level of the organization who would know who they were, but might not know them well and ask them to do something urgently as a special, you know, favor. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you get a call from your organization's president and your middle management, but you're not the very top, right? Um, that's something that you're probably going to try and jump through hoops to do to appeal to somebody. So figuring out who's the right level of person to target is something that they, they do because they don't want to waste their time. Right? Right. They don't want to call up the, the VP as the president because they're going to know each other. Right? Um, they're not going to want to call up the person working you know, in the mailroom because that person, there'd be no reason for the president of the company to ever call them. Right? Right. So, um, so more often than not, it's, it's an attempt to select. right? And it's selecting... But the selection is often not that deliberate, right? They can just set things up in a way that it's going to work. If, if you want to sell fake art that's been mass produced, doing it on a cruise ship isn't a bad idea, right? Because people are there, they see some art, and it's like, oh, I'm going, I have some money typically. And like, okay, I'll, I'll you know, buy this and not think that, you know, maybe I shouldn't be buying fine art at a, at a cruise ship. Mm hmm yeah. yeah. Now you didn't mention also there are these scams where uh, people will call and and pretend to be someone's daughter and say they're kidnapped yeah. and and, th and that sort yeah. of thing, right? This this is a pretty new variant and it, and it's really disturbing. So it's you know that your kid's been in a car accident or your kid has been arrested and you need this money to get them out right away and you know it, it's appealing to fear, mm -hmm. right, and urgency, which are two common hallmarks for this sort of get me money quick sort of scams. Um, and those you know I, I'm. This is one of those areas where I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of, um, you know, calling up parents or grandparents who are, you know, really concerned about their kid. Um, you can make a lot of those calls and you don't have to hit very often to make a lot of money real quick. Um, the thing that I'm afraid of is that as technology advances, as AI advances, you're going to be able to synthesize somebody's voice. So it makes it that much harder to realize it's a scam. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think we're heading into a world where novel variants of those are going to be much more dangerous. And we have mm -hmm. to, I, I think, again, it comes down to how do we take preventative steps so we don't have to question when we're under pressure, like when we're in that moment, how do we recognize that this isn't legit? Right? Mm -hmm. And one thing I've talked with my family about is we're going to have a code phrase. Right? So if there's ever any ambiguity about whether this is legit, ask for the code phrase. No harm in doing that. And that will that will tell us okay this is legitimately the person who says it is and they would know it right mm -hmm. if somebody actually were arrested they would give that code phrase to let people know that it was true right yeah that's that's yeah. clever I, that, I think yeah. that's gonna be, you should share that insight yeah, yeah um, absolutely. but um there's a point in the book where you said something about how you know people have a bias towards yes and mm -hmm. it's hard for them to say no and mm -hmm. you propose that people instead of thinking in this binary that we think in terms of kind of a continuum like yeah. you know the, the the probability that something is true and immediately when you do that then all mm -hmm. of a sudden it forces you to 
you know, to, yeah. to weigh the, the, the pros and cons. And this is similar to my colleague, Don Moore, right? Who says, you know, always attach a confidence interval to like yep. every point estimate, you know, and yep. it's changed my life. Right. I mean, yeah. I, I no longer say I'll, I'll be there at 8 PM. I say I'll be there at 8 PM plus or minus 15 minutes. Yep. Um, but it seems like a, it's a relatively hard thing for, for people to do. Right. Um, it's, it's not something we've done a lot of, right? It, it's, you know, it, it's very easy to have dichotomous thinking that you know, this is true or this isn't true. This is fake or this is genuine, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it's an extra step that requires sort of parsing the world more finely than we're used to doing. So just saying how likely is it is really hard. We don't we don't tend to think in terms of you know seventy nine percent as opposed to one hundred percent, zero percent, or maybe fifty fifty, right? It's hard to think about. It's hard to think about. You know, what is a what is a sixty four percent chance of rain today mean? Mm -hmm. Right. That that's not an intuitive notion for people who haven't thought about statistics and haven't thought about confidence intervals. Right. But why don't we do that in science? I mean, I mean, we kind of do, but I don't think we do it systematically, right? In the yeah. sense that I mean, I remember this must have been like twenty five years ago, and mm -hmm. I remember um, thinking about how overconfidence related to you know, information. And I remember reading the OSCAMP study, which was like from, you know, or actually I remember everybody would refer to OSCAMP. OSCAMP said this, OSCAMP did this, 1967, and then everyone would cite it and everyone would reference it. And then I, I went and looked at it and there was like a sample size of 12 people. And yet, you know, there must have been a thousand citations to this thing called OSCAMP yeah. and, and, and no one had replicated it. And I thought, mm -hmm. You know, how does something become conventional wisdom? I mean, shouldn't it, yeah. shouldn't it have just through repetition? Why wouldn't it be like, okay, here's something that's suggestive, and mm -hmm. then it stays suggestive until we have, you know, more evidence uh, to support it? Yeah, I mean, I wish, I wish we could remain uncertain longer, right? And part of it is the incentive, in the sciences, part of it, I think, is the incentive structure that, you know, people want to be known for a discovery. Mm -hmm. And discovery is actually really rare, right? I mean, true discovery that didn't, unlike anything that came before it, right? That sort of breakthrough finding. It's like, we shouldn't be seeing those a lot. Right? Mm -hmm. And in established fields, we don't. We see refinement. Um, and the discovery, the actual discovery comes after you've had a lot of work that lays out all of the all of the things that matter, all the parameters, all the, all the variation that matters. And then you have a really good mechanistic understanding of something. But there's there's this real desire to publish the first paper on something and make a big grand claim. And if you look at the titles of papers, right, they're all, you know, this is true, right? Not this is true under the following conditions with the following constraints. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I kind of tried a little bit to kind of work towards this. Uh, my colleague Steve Lindsay and uh, Yuichi Shoda try, wrote a paper on constraints on generality as something that should be in, uh, I think, in all empirical journal articles. It should be a statement of you know, what do we know about how general this is in terms of the people we studied or the materials we used? Do we know that this works outside of the lab? Do we know that this works with people other than college sophomores? Um, do we know that it works cross-culturally, right? If we don't, then we can say, okay, we don't know. We don't have evidence that this is a general phenomenon. We could say, here's why we think it will be. Here's why we think it won't be, right? So for my own work on failures of awareness and noticing gorillas and things like that, you know, I now know that that works cross-culturally and that it works with a wide range of people and that we've gotten it to work in the lab and we've gotten it to work in, you know, big classroom settings and um, we've gotten it to work with online testing and with in the lab testing. So we can say, we, have, we with a new study, we can say, okay, we have a lot of reason to think that this will be general, but we haven't tested it with this particular set of materials. So it might not be, right? Here's why we think it is, but we don't know. And that, that remaining uncertain lays the groundwork for what should be done to kind of build on a discovery, right? To build it into something that you can say, yes, this is a truth. So if we had, say, truth police in the sciences, I mean, there'd be, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm serious. I mean, yeah. I, I know, you know, like my colleague Leif Nelson and Yuri mm -hmm. Simonson, I mean, they've kind of appointed yeah. themselves as kind of the truth police. Right. And um, it's just kind of a thankless task, I guess. Um, it is. You know, I mean, everybody, gonna... like, as, as uh, Yuri Simonson said at some point, Everybody loves uh, that there are whistleblowers, but they don't love the whistleblower. Right? Right. I'm paraphrasing. And, and, and you yeah. know, no one, no one's going to get a Nobel Prize for, for you know, right. pointing out failures and flaws in other people's research. Yeah. But you get you get hated rather than getting awarded. <laughs> yeah. Right. But yeah. but it seems like if there were um, 
if there were these these uh, truth mm-hmm. police, some of them could focus on the internal validity, and and mm-hmm. others could focus yep. on the external validity, right? And so the yeah. the the internal validity would just say like, okay, I mean, you you could without even doing a replication, you could just look at the the numbers, right? And mm-hmm. and and you know apply like this you know grim test or you know whatever, and say, hey, this doesn't hold up. Then you know you could look at the the, the data, see if the data is legit, and so mm-hmm. forth. But then a whole separate group of police would probably just police the, um, you know, the implications part of the paper, mm-hmm. right? Where people say, yeah. therefore, you know, yeah. and they rattle off all these. I mean, it's yeah. okay to speculate, but I think, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of times people yeah. go a little go a little far in, in their speculations, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I've seen the, the papers where people have a very small intervention and they kind of are very careful in the language. And then the general conclusion, it's this applies to everything it explains to the world. Yeah, and it's just... Yeah, it's too much. I mean, the, the problem is that there's, you know, the scope is not a simple thing to solve, right? That there are so many papers being submitted and, and it's increasing, right? And there aren't that many people, you know, each time going through a paper in depth, and I've done this for a few papers where you, you have to kind of really go through in depth, check all the numbers, make sure. And if you talk to people who do meta-analyses, kind of analyses of a whole bunch of findings from literature, every one of them who's got experience with that will tell you, Yep, this paper's wrong. This paper had errors. Um, this paper might be fraud, right? And in a big enough analysis, you're always going to find those, right? So who does the policing? How do you manage that? The incentive structures to get the field corrected, they're not great. It's really hard to get papers pulled from the literature or even corrected. So, you know, unless there's a change to the structure of how publication works, it's hard to kind of get that fixed. There's just not enough, you know, Simonsons and Leifs and um, you know, Nick Browns, and there's just not enough of those folks around to really cover it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there are ways to get part of the way there. So some journals have started requiring checking for, you know, just checking basic numbers, like do do the numbers add up? Do they meet this Grimm test? Do they, do the p-values correspond to the test statistics they report, right, in, mm-hmm. the, in the statistics? Those are easy and automatable, right? Um, So psychological science started doing that a few years back, and the number of p-value errors in papers is way down, right? Because it's a check just automatically before it goes to production, right? And if they find errors, they say, here's a problem, you know? And if it's a big problem, then they they rethink it. If it's a little problem, it's, okay, you made an error here. You copied and pasted wrong. Um, But yeah, I mean, I I think that the field can improve in this as it requires more analysis code to be available and more data to be available, but it's it's a hard problem. Now, what what about at the more kind of general public level? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Look, I mean, it's great to have someone say, when you walk down the street, make sure you look around your shoulders and walk down. I remember Mm -hmm. I used to live in a neighborhood where I'd have to walk down the middle of the street and you'd be looking around. And I thought, you know, it'd be much nicer just to have safe Mm -hmm. streets, right? (laughs) You know, maybe have some decent police or whatever. Um, yeah. And so, you know, on the internet, everybody mm-hmm. is zapping these, you know, clickbait headlines yep. to everybody, and they don't. Yeah. Sometimes they don't even read them, and 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 these things proliferate. Yeah. And while we have like the SEC, which kind of does its job on public securities, mm-hmm. and we have the FTC yeah. that kind of protects against certain, you know, claims, we mm-hmm. don't really have, you know, the the truth place on the internet. I mean, there've been yeah. attempts. I know um, folks. I know some folks at Facebook that have. Mm-hmm tried to they're fine but yeah i tried to yeah. monitor this but but um you know it's at the end of the day yeah. is, is it just like hey there are certain domains like social media that are just like dangerous streets and we, <laughs> there's too much work to 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 kind of wade yeah. between the 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 truth and the falsities should we just it, stay it out sure of those feels neighbors? like that i mean that, that's kind of the the big challenge for any social media company is moderation right mm-hmm. and that that's why people who have run social media companies were you know, doubting that Elon Musk would be able to do it effectively because he didn't seem to realize that you can't just make everything a free-for-all because then you get people planning terrorist actions, right? And mm-hmm. you have to moderate, right? There has to be some moderation and that balance between moderation and censorship is not trivial, right? So, you know, what what kind of truth policing do you need for social media? It's really hard if people are just going to forward things that they like. And this, this happens all the time. People forward things that fit their own beliefs without checking whether they're they're right or not, right? And often, the more you dig, the more you realize they're just nonsense. Right? But it, it's really hard to, how do, you, how do you kind of regulate that? There are places like Snopes and other sites that will say, yes, this is fake, right? But that doesn't stop it from 
getting out there in the same way that that you know, study that's completely implausible that had 12 participants and has never been replicated gets cited thousands of times because nobody actually goes back and, and says, no, this isn't what we should be saying about it. Right? Mm -hmm. the, the corrections don't get cited. The original claims do. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if there's an easy fix for that as an automated system other than just getting people to say, is it possible that this is wrong? Right? Um, you know, how would I how would I verify that this is right? Just mm. taking that one question, and then you you get that confidence interval that you were mentioning around it. Like maybe this isn't true, right? Well, look, I, we didn't even dig into all the, the habits and the hooks, but but yeah. I think the, the the general project that you're um, mm. involved in, I mean, it, it seems a bit paradoxical because on the one hand, you emphasize the the finiteness of our attentional resources, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, yeah. but on the other, you know, you really are trying to help people become better decision makers, become yeah. more aware of the possibilities and limitations of their of their intuition. So, mm -hmm. I mean, are, are you an optimist or a realist when it comes to helping people engage the world in, in a more thoughtful and, and, and useful way? Uh, I, I guess I'd say I'm an optimist in the sense that I think it's possible, right, to better understand you know how we think how understand ourselves in a way that can help us prevent kind of the worst cases of deception so i'm an optimist in the sense that yeah i think we really can head off disaster if we're aware of what we find appealing what which things are those red capes that we just charge forward into without thinking about them if you can kind of anticipate hey this is one of those situations and the more you kind of think about it the more you recognize them you know, and we spot these all the time now um, where you're just running into something blind, not realizing what might be hiding. Um, if you kind of start to look for those, that can really head off a lot of disasters. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm an optimist in the sense that I think it's possible. Um, I'm a realist in the sense that not everybody's going to do it. Mm -hmm. right? So you know, the scammers are going to continue to succeed because they'll find somebody else. So on a global scale, you know, I'm, I'm not optimistic about scams being eliminated because you know they've been around forever. But I'm optimistic that individuals can get around this problem, or at least most of the time when it matters the most, as opposed to worrying about it when it doesn't matter. And, and do, you, do you do periodic gullibility audits of your own, um, you know, uh, trust behavior? <laughs> do you, do you, and, and, is it, and you do it, is it domain specific, right? So you say, yeah. okay, you know, when it comes to my finances, mm -hmm. I have this level <laughs> of trust when, when yeah. I'm reading about um, vaccines and so forth. I have this level of trust. I mean, how, do, yeah. you, do you, how, how free, you know, how frequently do you need to kind of go in and, and rebalance your, your, your trust portfolio? Is this something that's a continuous time thing or is this sort of, you know, once a year, I'm going to go back and, and audit my, my gullibility? Um, I, I think of it as a little bit like balancing, you know, like you don't want to be doing that you know, if you have a, a set of investments, you've got some mutual funds, you've got some bonds, you don't want to be rebalancing every three days because that's not smart and it's not cost effective. You want to kind of take a look every now and then, you know, once a year and just make sure that you've kind of got your balance right. Um, for me, I find that it's more on a specific case by case basis. So um, I generally, if somebody shares something on social media, you know, I, I now know if it really appeals to me, I should say, okay, what's the evidence for that? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to remain uncertain for a little bit longer, right? Um, and it's hard to do that when you see something that perfectly matches what you want to believe. So I, I tend not to immediately reshare things on Twitter um, based on a headline or on Facebook based on a headline or a blurb. And I'll, I'll look at it and say, okay, could this be faked to kind of propagate? And, you know, more often than not, it's like, yeah, it could be. So I'm just going to hold off on sharing that. Mm -hmm. And just that alone... You know, just that asking that question can make a big difference for, you know, not spreading misinformation. Right. Well, Dan, thank you so much. Um, new book Absolutely. is new book's called Nobody's Fool. Definitely check it out. Um, also, Visible Gorilla. I mean, it's still amazing. I was rereading yeah. it and I was like, oh, I love it. Now I remember why I love this book. And of course, um, the experiments that are up on your, your website. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I recommend that anybody who has not yet. <laughs> <laughs> checked out those experiments <laughs> should definitely uh, check them out and kind of yeah. try them out on their friends family coworkers, and so forth so thanks so much Dan my pleasure thanks for having me this is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM connecting people through stories